A mixture of mind-altering drugs and mental illness was the toxic combination that took Peter Green from the music scene and led him into obscurity. But there was a time when he was right up there on top. Back in the mid-60s, Eric Clapton was known around the UK as the God. Peter Green was known as the Green God. His warm voice and distinctive guitar playing set in motion the first incarnation of the band Fleetwood Mac to stardom in the United Kingdom. For a time, his guitar playing and songwriting was some of the finest out there. His best known composition, Black Magic Woman, cracked the charts over in England, then stormed to the top 10 in the United States when Santana covered it. Carlos would always give credit to Peter when performing this song. Yes, there was a time when Peter Green's name was mentioned in the same breath as Eric Clapton, but sadly, I guess it just wasn't meant to be. He was born Peter Allen Greenbaum, October 29, 1946, in Bethnal Green, London, to Jewish couple Joe and Ann Greenbaum. He was the youngest of their four children. Peter's interest in music started early on when his older brother taught him a few chords on the guitar at age 10. Peter then took those few chords and started learning the instrument. This would start his love affair with the guitar and music. Early on, his influences were Hank Marvin of The Shadows, and then came the American blues artists such as Muddy Waters and Albert King. Peter was a quick study, and by the time he was 15, he was playing the guitar and the bass guitar in a number of local bands. It was around this time he changed his name to Peter Green, and took his first playing job as a bass player in a band called Bobby Dennis and the Dominoes, then moving on to a group called the Muskrats. Sometime in 1965, he filled in for Eric Clapton in John Mayall's Blues Breakers for a few gigs. Later on, he would become a full-time member of the Blues Breakers, but not before hooking up with a group called Peter B's Lunars, who had a tall, lanky drummer working with them named Mick Fleetwood. There's no doubt that Peter was spreading himself around the music scene and making himself known and involved in various different blues and rock and roll tribute bands, but Peter never seemed to stick with the group too long. In 1966, Eric Clapton was to get together with drummer Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce and form their own group, but a little before that, he was tiring of the music he was performing with John Mayall and the Blues Breakers and decided to leave to look for greener pastures. So without a guitarist, John Mayall would contact Peter Green and he would soon join taking Eric Clapton's spot on stage. It was with the Blues Breakers that Peter would record the album and receive critical acclaim for his work on that album, A Hard Road. Already one of the better blues guitarists on the scene, his skills as a songwriter were developing quickly. But again, it wouldn't take Peter long before he was looking for something better, and the next step was to form his own group. Formed in London in 1967, Peter recruited drummer Mick Fleetwood, guitarist and singer Jeremy Spencer, and bassist Bob Brunning, with John McVie replacing Brunning a few weeks after their first public appearance. Green would take part of both names of his drummer and bass player and call the group Fleetwood Mac. It would start out being billed as Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac featuring Jeremy Spencer, but Peter put a stop to that. He just wanted the band called Fleetwood Mac. The first two studio albums proved a success in the UK and more was to follow with the release of the song Black Magic Woman and Albatross. But with the success also came the money and the drugs. In 1969, the group signed with Warner Brothers Records and recorded their third studio album, which prominently featured new third guitarist and songwriter 18-year-old Danny Kerwin. Green had first seen Kerwin play in 1967 while he was playing with his blues trio, Boiler House. Green was impressed with his playing and used the band as a support act for Fleetwood Mac before recruiting Kerwin to his own band at the suggestion of Mick Fleetwood. Around this time, Green's bandmates began to notice changes in his state of mind. He was taking large doses of LSD, grew his beard, and began to wear robes and a crucifix. Mick Fleetwood recalled Green becoming concerned about accumulating wealth. I had conversations with Peter Green because he was obsessed about money. 
wanting us to give it all away. Many think the tipping of the scales for Peter was in 1970 on a road trip to play a gig in Munich, Germany. This couple appeared at the airport, greeting the band like old friends, especially Peter. They ended up following Peter around for the rest of the day and went to watch a group's performance later that night. After the gig, this weird couple took Peter, along with guitarist Danny Kerwin, to a huge mansion, which they had turned into a hippie commune. Peter and Danny took some LSD and began jamming with members of the commune in the basement of this house. When Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, and Jeremy Spencer later arrived, they were met by the road manager who had a worried look on his face. He warned them that Green was tripping out badly. They were soon to check out of their hotel and leave Munich. Now, although Peter Green had already started to show signs of mental illness, this particular incident was the one from which he never fully recovered. When asked about it later, Peter said, I went on a trip and never came back. Well, the truth be known, he never came back because he kept dropping LSD for one thing. A psychiatrist once said that there wasn't solid proof that taking LSD would bring on mental health issues, but... In the same sentence, he said he sure didn't see how it helped it any. Toward the end with Fleetwood Mac, as I said earlier, he grew his beard out and started wearing white robes and he expressed a disillusionment about fame and money, while his behavior on and off stage became increasingly erratic. After a May 1970 concert, he walked away from the band that he had started. He had been quoted as saying he expected one day to leave the band and then went on to say, they're my friends, I'm going to leave them with the name. And he did just that. Peter would release a solo album right after leaving the group titled, The End of the Game. It was a very different style of album compared to the work he did with Fleetwood Mac. Instrumentals for the most part. Some people didn't like it. Some called it a masterpiece. For myself, it's art. It sounded to me like Peter Green's tortured mind crying out. If you've never heard this album, I'll leave you a YouTube link in the description box. Check it out and give me your thoughts on it. Sadly, that's about all we'd hear from him in the decade to come. He followed this album's release with two singles, one released in 1971 and one in 1972. But Green's solo career was then put on hold because of his faltering mental state. He did make another appearance with Fleetwood Mac. He was called in sometime in February or March of 1971 to finish a tour after guitarist Jeremy Spencer had left the group. He performed under the name Peter Blue. Around this time, Peter was trying to record a second solo album, but it just didn't materialize. The drugs and mental illness had just become too much for him. As time moved on and treatment for mental disorders advanced, Peter seemed to get a bit better. In the 1990s, he went on to form the Peter Green Splinter Group. They recorded some albums during their time together. One was the Robert Johnson Songbook. The album was cover versions of every song Robert Johnson was known to have recorded, but it seemed his guitar playing lacked the intensity of his days. This was probably due to the medication he was on. Regardless of the cause, Green was irreversibly changed in the 2009 documentary, his former manager Clifford Davis describes feeling heartbroken when he shared a meal with an unkept green who had inches long fingernails and ate with his hands. His longtime bandmate, friend and co-founder Mick Fleetwood says, it's not about the long fingernails and being lost. I need that to be made very clear. It's about the respect for what this person and the band at the time represented. Sometime in around 2003 or so, Mick Fleetwood, who had kept in touch with Peter Green through the years, had talked him into a return. Peter had agreed to play a concert with him, but sadly, at the last minute, he canceled out. I didn't often know how his mind worked, and I felt let down, Mick said. I realized I needed to let it go. It's painful, but it pays no dividends to you or the person you're trying to hang on to. But time has a way. In February of 2020, six months before the death of Peter Green, Mick enlisted an all-star cast for a one-of-a-kind concert 
at the London Palladium honoring the early years of Fleetwood Mac and its founder, Peter Green. Although he didn't attend, this was a great honor to him and his music. During the show, Kirk Hammett played Peter's 59 Les Paul, which he now owns, on the Green Manalishi. Peter Green died in his sleep July 25th of 2020. He was worth 4.5 million pounds at the time of his death. In his will, he left three quarters of it to his brothers and sister, and a quarter of it to his daughter Rose from his short marriage to Jane Samuels in 1978, on the condition she could prove she was his daughter. Why? Who knows what went on in the mind of Peter Green. Peter wrote, produced, and recorded some of those great early Fleetwood Mac songs like Albatross, Man of the World, and many more. Paranoia, schizophrenia, and numerous LSD trips took away what I consider one of the best guitar players the UK ever produced. I'll leave some links in the description section of some of the great books and documentaries on Peter Green if you want to check out more about him. Thanks for watching.